I'm going to start with something we may have a lot in common, but I'm going to start with something I know we have in common, and that's pontoon boats. Oh, yeah. I've got an old pontoon boat at an old lake place on about 50 miles from here. When was the last time you saw your pontoon boat? I heard you mention it once. Memorial Day. You did get to see it then. Yeah, I, we always go to the lake on Memorial Day. That kind of, where I come from in West Virginia, that kind of starts the summer season. But I have an interesting story about all this because, you know, I'm a speedboat guy and mm -hmm. I like the jet skis and all that stuff. So when we finally got around to getting a place of our own on the lake, Terry says, we got to have a pontoon boat. I said, we can't have a pontoon slow. boat. It's too slow and why would we want one? But we use that boat more than any other boat we have. And yep. everybody loves it and everybody loves riding in it. And we get 10, 12 people and it's it's a great social way to, to spend time with friends and family. So. Is it in the water or is it on a trailer right now? It's in, it's in the water. It's, so if you yeah. got there quick enough, you could get it cranked up. Well, bad. when we go on vacation, we'll be, we'll be in it. Well, I appreciate your time today. I want to start with um, Nick's kids. We've heard a lot about you and a lot about football and a lot about you coming to Alabama. And I've only heard a little bit about Nick's kids and what Terry, your wife, and others and you do with that. Tell me, first of all, what is Nick's kids? What does it do? Well, Nick's kids is a foundation that we started long ago to try to raise money or use our position to raise some money, give some money, use our own money to try to promote any kind of kids group that needs help, um, whether it's for medical reasons, uh, people who are less fortunate, um, um, promote athletics. Uh, it comes from my dad started Pop Warner football in the state of West Virginia when I was 10 years old. And he bought a school bus and he went and picked the kids up in the four or five coal mining towns, took them to practice, took them home at night. And a lot of the guys that got to do that got college scholarships because we never participated until we got to high school. And it created a lot of opportunities for a lot of people and he helped a lot of people. And my mother always supported that. My sister has continued to do that. And I felt like that would be a great way for me to kind of extend his legacy um, to help young people and that's what we've been able to do and we feel now that we can do significant things to help young people. You know, uh, you have a big golf tournament coming up. I was hoping to meet Terry today, maybe include her in the interview, but she's covered up getting ready for that. That's the purpose of the golf tournament, raising money for whatever Nick's kids sees a need is. Right. What, what we've done is we've taken, whether it's money I get for speaking engagements, mm -hmm. whatever. We put it all in the fund, the Nick's Kids Fund. We have this one fundraiser, uh, which we really appreciate all the people who have supported it. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, we you know, give a significant amount of money. I'm talking about two, three hundred thousand dollars to these various groups uh, that we can support, you know, to help. Um, and, and it makes us feel good that we can give something back to the community and we can promote young people which is what we deal with, and our success is because of young people. Right. So it's a way for us to give back. Barry and I were talking about his daughter with the challenge. We all have kids with challenges or know people who do. Ultimately, what you do for someone less fortunate uh, might make your obituary someday. Uh, you know, your wins and losses will too, but what you did significantly for other people really does matter short term and long. Well, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, when I was a kid, Christmas was big because I got all the presents. You know, but now Christmas is better because I give all the presents. And we get the most self-gratification from what we give, not from what we get. And e even in ball, you know, even in the football part of it, mm -hmm. to win the national championship, the greatest self-gratification for that is that so many other people were happy. It made so many other people proud and happy. And you know, we'd like to do the same thing here at the University of Alabama, but again, how it affects other people is really how we get most of our self-gratification from what we do and the hard work that we do. And this is another way that we feel great about being, help, be, being able to help someone else. I don't know if she likes you talking about her when she's not around, but tell me about Terry. I've not met her. Everyone that I talked to, whenever I tried to get her to come, they said, boy, I hope she can because she's great. She is just a great person. And people that didn't have to say that, tell me about your wife. Well, she is a great person, but she's a real people person. She loves people and uh, she has great compassion for other people. Um, everything starts with family, with us, and um, she's always been that way. And she's been very supportive of, you know, this coaching is not a family-friendly kind of career. So you have to have a special wife to start with to support you through that. But 
there's a lot of sacrifices they have to make because of the time you're going and the things that you do. And they have to be a special parent because you're really being the parent to a lot of other young people as well as your own. So uh, she's pretty special and she's been very supportive and uh, she's been very helpful. She's a good recruiter too, so that helps. <laughs> Can't hurt. Can't hurt. I um, took my boys to their first NFL game uh, in Indiana on December 31st. You probably remember the day I well. Remember that game. Uh, we were the ones up in the stands with the sign that said, Coach Saban, we'll take you back to Alabama with us. So it was too small of a sign for you to ever see. You talk a great deal about looking forward only, and I don't want to look back much. After that game, and I know then, like any coach, you were concentrated on the Indianapolis Colts, and you were the right. only team and coach that had trouble with them. As soon as that game was over, is that when you started shifting gears about thinking about Alabama and how that might be a possibility? Was it kind of right after that? Right. Well, kind of the irony in all that is the first game that I ever coached in the NFL when I was at the Houston Oilers was the, against the Indianapolis right. Colts in the Dome there. And I remember Ron Dickerson catching a hook and ladder and running it for about 70 yards right before the half. And then to pay, play against the Super Bowl as the last game that I coached in the NFL against the Super Bowl Champions. champions. Yeah. And, um, you know, Peyton Manning and a great team and Tony Dungy and a great team. But uh, I was completely focused on what we were doing there. And I know I've been criticized a lot for the way I handled this, but I really tried to handle it in a way that was best for our team and the players on our team. And, and that's always what comes first to me. Uh, and, you know, maybe that wasn't what was best for the media, but my loyalty was to those players and trying to do the best for them and our staff and the people who had worked hard to make the Miami Dolphins what they were. And it was my responsibility and obligation to a great man, the owner, Wayne Huizenga. So when we got home from that game, you know, we, we started thinking about direction and, you know, what, what would – and really what it came down to is where is your heart? You know, we love college football. We love being able to affect people at that 18 to 23-year-old level, not just as football players, but as people and as students and helping them be more successful in life for having been involved in the program. So, you know, there was a self-gratification in that mm -hmm. that wasn't anything wrong with pro ball, wasn't anything wrong with pro players, wasn't anything wrong with the competition, that that just not something that you really do as a pro. And, and uh, being a pro is a completely different concept. And... Uh, it was a great experience for us. We learned a lot about ourselves, and we're pleased and happy with the challenge that we have here at the University of Alabama. Once you become a head coach, whether it's Michigan State, LSU, Miami, or the University of Alabama, you're probably not going to make any decision that doesn't generate some criticism, whether it's media or someone else. That's just part of the ball game, right? That's part of life. Well, and I, and I think that you know part of that comes from all those people have a passion for either Alabama, the Miami Dolphins, LSU, wherever it might be. Sure. And I respect that. Right. And, and, and I don't criticize it at all. Um, you know, what was accomplished at LSU, for example, uh, the people in, in, in Louisiana are special to me. They always will be. What was accomplished there was special. They all contributed to it. Mm -hmm. And nothing's ever going to change that for me and my feelings about what was done there. It's a special time and it's a station in my life that I'll never forget. You know, I hope we can do that again here and make the people of Alabama feel the same way. You're right at six months of being the head coach at the University of Alabama. You kind of found your stride, comfort level. You know where the men's room is now. You know, are you happy coming to work every day now and feel like you really are kind of in the swing of things now? Right. Well, we're pleased and happy with the challenge that we have. But anytime you're a new staff and you're a new program, it's like we have camp for high school and and even the junior high mm -hmm. kids this mm -hmm. week and. You know, it's a new challenge for everybody. I mean, everything you go through is new. You know, spring ball is new. Off-season program is new. How you recruit is new. Spring recruiting was new. So, you know, it's a work in progress, but we have a great staff. We have a great bunch of people here. We have a very supportive group. Uh, everybody has really joined the team and bought into what we're trying to do, and I think that's the most important thing at this stage, and we'll get it up and running as we go. I have notes. This isn't on my notes. When you bump up against high school kids that would love to play for Alabama, or junior high kids you come in contact with, do you remember being their age and coming up against, being around someone like you and thinking, oh my gosh, I, I want to impress him? Do you, do you remember well enough to reverse that and know what they're thinking, that they're in awe of you, and I'm trying to make a good question out of it? Do you remember what that's like for yeah, these kids? I, I do remember what it's like, and I think what it's, what's important to me 
to always remember in my position is not to be self-absorbed about who I am or what I am, but think about who they are and where they are and how I can affect that. And I just said to the staff this morning, we were doing evaluations for 400 and some kids that were from 8 to 13 years old, and I said, guys, make sure you do a good job with these evaluations because what's on this sheet means the world to that particular person. Right. And you got to remember that. So to give a little time, to sign an autograph, to talk a little bit, I mean, that means a lot to that young person. And I think you have to remember that. I think that's something we all have to remember. That's, you know, these these young people are our future, and we have to try to invest some time in trying to develop that. The same we would do for our own children, I think. Just like you did with your dad, like I did with my dad, I spend a lot of time, yet today, trying to please him. And you know these young kids, whether they ever play for you or not, they right. just want to please you and make you realize that they've got some talent, whether it's for you or not. And you remember that. Man. No, absolutely. Uh, I'm reading a book now, The Essential Wooden, John Wooden. He says, he, he coached a different game at a different time, and you probably know his quotes as well or better than I do. Success may result in winning, but winning does not necessarily mean you're a success. That impresses me with that, and the scoreboard matters, winning the games matters, but as you know, Coach Wooden drove home to his players and his teams the importance of performing at your best level. Right. Does that quote fit Nick Saban pretty well as far as your attitude about well, success? I, I say it a little different, a little differently. Mm -hmm. It means the same thing. There's a difference between being a champion and winning a championship. You know, and what I constantly try to get our players to do is be a champion. It means you're a team player. It means you positively affect the people around you. It means you're responsible for your own self-determination in terms of what you do. You're responsible for your part of it, and you work hard every day to dominate the people that you're going to have to compete against. So it really says the same thing. What we're asking for is for everyone to be the best they can be at what they choose to do. And if you do that, you really are a champion. And if we can get a group of people doing that together, then that group can be a champion. And if they're going to, if they can be that, then they're going to have a chance to win a championship. So it's what do you put first? You know, the mm -hmm. process of what it takes to be successful relative to the result. And I think what we're both trying to be is process-oriented people who try to get people to do the right stuff so that they can be successful. Military people tell me they are able to storm up a hill into gunfire because they don't want to let their buddies down. There's some of that analogy in, in a team sport as well. well I, 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 yeah, and I think when you're responsible for your own self-determination, you're being responsible to the other guy. Right. When you're a team player, there's a certain amount of trust and respect that you have for each other. And part of that is, I'm going to do my part. Right. I'm going to want to let the other guy down. So uh, I think th 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 there's a lot. You know, and this whole thing that we do in sports, you know, it's a metaphor of life. I mean, playing golf is a metaphor of life, you know, because you always got to line up for the next shot, the next play, and your ability to focus and overcome adversity that may have happened in the last circumstance or the success that you may have had in the last circumstance. Nothing matters but what happens next. You know, what do I do next? You know, you never really kind of arrive. You never really get there. You always grow and learn and get better. And when you look at it that way, sports are a tremendous opportunity for us to learn some of those lessons that will help us in life. Until recently, I was blessed to have three heroes, none of them celebrity, just heroes of mine. One of them died at the age of 97 recently, so I still have two. One of them is my dad. Can you name three heroes? And I've got a feeling, I think I've read enough, that your dad is one of yours, just well, on work ethic and everything else. My dad would certainly be one of mine. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, my mother would be too. You know, my parents and the support group of people that, West Virginia, you know, I pumped gas from the time I was 11 years old until I got out of high school and worked on cars. And But the lessons that I learned uh, about hard work and discipline and character and choices and decisions that you make all the time, you know, come from the support group that I, I had at home and the family that I had. And I appreciate that probably above all. And my parents, my mother and father were, you know, certainly a significant part of that. But my high school coach, you know, was also one of those people who had a tremendous effect. And my college coach, Don James, you know, uh, had the same kind of effect. But I think I was affected and think of those people because 
I was in a station in my life where those mentors had a tremendous impact. Now, I've been very fortunate professionally to be around some great people and have learned a lot from all those people, and I appreciate that as well. Before you were a head coach, tell me, you mentioned your college coach you played for, Coach James, coached under Coach Perilous and some several, several other great coaches at the college level. Uh, if, you, if you were an athletic director looking for a coach, past or present, who's the best game day coach you've ever worked under and with? Well, that's a tough one because there's there's some really good ones. Know. You know, Don James was an outstanding coach for the years he was at Kent State and in the 17 years he was at the University of Washington, had a tremendous program. And, you know, he's a great person, a class guy, and really did a great job of the principles and values that he instilled in his teams that helped them from a competitive standpoint, but it helped them as people as well, and I think it affected me tremendously. You know, George Perlis was... Um, a great people person, he was a great manager, a great organizer, did a great job of recruiting, but the players loved him. I mean, they, they loved him uh, because you, he was exactly, you knew exactly what you were going to get, and there was nothing phony about him in any way, shape, or form, and uh, we built a program there and won a championship, so um, that that's someone that I would have to think was one of the best that I've ever been around. and. You know, Bill Belichick, obviously, as a, as a pro coach, has proven, uh, and I worked for him before anybody, before he won any championships, and knew that he had some tremendous organizational characteristics and his systematic approach to how you go about things and what you do and how he handles people and gets great players to play well together. I mean, um, so it's hard to pick one, uh, but I think we've talked about three there that are all pretty pretty good. Pretty good. But, I want to say this, that everyone that I've ever worked for, I've learned a lot yeah. from. And, and I, I would, whether it's Jerry Glanville or, um, you know, whoever, um, Earl Bruce at Ohio State, uh, the lessons that learned from Woody Hayes being around in those days. I mean, all those people had an effect. I only have a few more questions. I interviewed a man dying of cancer a couple of years ago. <clears throat> died a couple of weeks after I interviewed him. And my last question to him was, do you know your, what is your prognosis? And he looked me in the eye and said, my prognosis is exactly the same as yours. We're each promised today. Do you live life like that? Or do you live life season at a time, year at a time? Or do you appreciate this particular day where you're having to fool around with the media for a little while, but you've got a pretty full day. How, how do you think about your prognosis? Well, you know, there's a, there's a song that uh, the Eagles sing. Um, I don't know if the Eagles sing or Joe Walsh sings. I can't figure out the dynamics of that group all the time. But <laughs> can't keep it's up. called Life is Good to Me So Far. Yeah. And, and, and I feel that way. You know, uh, I feel like I've been very fortunate in the experiences that I've had, whether it's in a childhood that really didn't have much but had great people and great family, uh, in the family that we've been able to be a part of developing my wife and I uh, and our children. Uh, and the experiences that we've had professionally and the opportunities that we have professionally and the opportunity we have here. And, and I love all the parts of my job. I, I love being with those little kids in camp this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't think I like the media, but that's not true at all. You know, I, I respect the media and what they have to do and know that they're a conduit to our fans and, mm -hmm. and respect that. Um, I, I, I love our players. and working with our players and helping them develop and have a special admiration for all the people who work with us to try to make those things happen. So um, I feel good about the promise that we have and uh, look forward to the challenges, and it's fun. A pretty good coach here uh, whose name is on the Coach of the Year trophy that you won uh, said once that if he ever quits coaching, he'll die within a month, and he almost nailed it to the day. Are you going to do like many of us our age, and you and I are about the same age, are you going to work forever, or do you see a time where you're going to say, you know what, Terry, pontoon boat's not been used enough. Let's, Because you said in your press conference right here that um, when you want to get away from it all, that's where you're headed. Do you really see yourself heading to the pontoon boat permanently, or is that really just kind of a dream down the road, maybe? You, you know, you, you think about that. Yeah, I do. You know, you <laughs> think about that. But I cannot imagine if I didn't have a whole lot of things going on like we do a lot of days how I would respond to all that. You know, I love to play golf, but I like to play golf because I'm busy all the time, and that's a change. Yeah. 
If I played it all the time, I don't know how much I'd like it. If I wrote on the pontoon boat all the time, I don't know how much I'd like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have some form of attention deficit. I get bored easily. Um, and if I got bored too much, I don't think I'd be a very happy guy. So, you know, even though you think about that because you're so busy and it's different from being busy, I'm not sure if that was life, how much I'd mi miss the being busy part because I do like challenges and I am kind of a doer in terms of trying to get things done and enjoy the challenges that you have to do things. I'm not sure how I'd fit into that role, but I'm sure we'll learn about that too. Yeah. It's like I learned about pro football and how I fit into that. We'll all learn how we fit into that riding a pontoon boat all the time someday, but um, you know, you got to have a good jude box on there or exactly. it'll really be bad. Got some good food. Yeah. I, I think you stumbled across something else we have in common. The only reason you and I weren't diagnosed ADD is they didn't know about it in it the back. 60s. They didn't know That's about right. it back then, but I, I definitely would have been diagnosed. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm done. Let me ask you my mother-in-law question. You have a mother-in-law. I have a mother-in-law, so mother you'll understand me asking my mother-in-law question. As I saw her this morning leaving my house, she said, oh, ask Coach Saban how many games you're going to win this year. As a media guy, I know how much you hate evaluating your team. I'm not going to ask you that question, but my, for my mother-in-law, she wants to know how many games you're going to win this year. Well, you know, I never make predictions. I, but, uh, Be nice to her. I had a wonderful mother-in-law. You know, she was a great mother to my wife and a great grandmother to our children. Right. And she passed away. And actually, we lost a game at Virginia Tech. Um, and I was like really in sorts and she was very very sick at the time and I called her after the game because Terry was with her mother and not at the game and it was one of the few games Terry ever missed so and we played horrible it was the first game of the season at Virginia Tech they were a very good team um, and we got beat 20 and it was after winning an SEC championship so everybody had these high expectations and we got beat like 24-6 and I mean we looked bad we got beat bad and we looked worse <laughs> and so I call and talk to her because she's in the hospital and not doing well. And I'm thinking she's going to get on me about we lost a game, you look bad, I watched a game on TV. She chewed me out for not wearing a hat because it was a sunny day. And said, she if you know, don't start wearing a hat, you know you're going to get skin cancer What's and all this stuff. What's wrong with you? Never mentioned the score. Never mentioned the score. So that's my mother in law story. And so can I go back and report to my mother in law that? you will win as many games as you and your team are prepared to do the best that you can do. Is that a good pat answer? And I, I think what I, I would like for everybody to say at the end of the day, that our team next year, if we could get them to play to their full potential, every guy yeah. doing the best they can do to do their job relative to their capabilities, I would be pleased as a coach. How many games that's going to allow us to win well relative to the competition, I, I, I really can't answer that. That's wooden philosophy right there. Just do the best we can this season. If we happen to win, don't compare yourself to the others. And so that's that's pretty close to that. I appreciate your time today. Good. I'm glad to finally meet you, and uh, we'll be rooting for you and your family, and especially for Nick's kids. Thanks. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.